How's it going? I'm Sean Kennedy. I'm a uh, visual effects artist and a compositor from Los Angeles, California. A um, little bit of a 3D generalist kind of thing, but I don't really do any one 3D thing great. Um, mostly 2D stuff. Uh, I've worked on a lot of feature films. I think like it's over 50 now, something like that. Um, TV shows, uh, commercials, short films, student films, independent films, everything you can think of that needs visual effects. Um, I've dabbled in, and uh, and I, I wasn't. I was trying to think when I was trying to think of topics. I was trying to think of something, uh, something relating very specifically to compositing to talk about, um, because you know obviously Blender is a 3D program, and I kind of wanted to do something less 3D, which is the compositing angle. So uh, I was trying to think of everybody. Everybody thinks of compositing, and they think of things like. Um, you know, like the Avengers, they think of putting the Hulk running through the city, smashing everything, or they think of, uh, you know, Harry Potter on broomsticks or whatever. They think of the big grand things that win Oscars and all that. Um, but what, what doesn't get a lot of press is probably about what is like 75% of a visual effects artist's daily life, and that's cleaning things, like fixing things. Um, the, the things that go wrong on film sets is uh, staggering. The, uh, it, it, things like boom mics dropping into frame, um, that's almost expected nowadays. Uh, but then there's things like people leaving stuff on tables or they don't get clearance for a logo on something. So you, now that, that laptop was in 25 shots in the movie and now we can't use that logo. So now we've got to <laughs> patch the logo on the back of the laptop for, you know, for an hour of the movie. So there's a lot of things like that. Um, my first job in visual effects ever, uh, but I barely knew anything. I, had no, I just knew how to set a keyframe in After Effects and I got hired at this place. And uh, my, it was on Austin Powers, Goldmember, the last Austin Powers movie. And uh, my very first job was, there's a shot where, uh, where Austin is chasing Dr. Evil up a ladder, uh, or maybe it's the other way around, but Austin falls and he grabs on to Dr. Evil's pants and pulls his pants down as he's falling. Um, uh, and just the first of uh, many, many of my visual effects shots in my career that have dealt with nudity. But uh, I had to remove a wire. There was, he had wires holding him up as he fell off this ladder and my job was just to remove the wire. Uh, and it wasn't like he was on a green screen or anything. He was in the set. The wire was over, you know, Dr. Evil's back is all moving around and wrinkles and you know they're fighting and struggling and then his, his butt's out, so I've got to patch that. Um, so it, was, uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't like just taking a quick little painted image and sticking it in there. I had to really work at it and not knowing anything, it took me ages, but anyway, I got it done and that's one of those things that, you know, that doesn't get written up in articles, that kind of stuff. So I thought it'd be fun to go through uh, using Blender for that kind of stuff, for the, the non-glamorous visual effects. Uh, so just curious, just to get an idea, how many people use the Blender compositor at all? Is there a lot? Yeah, lots, all right, that's good. Is there anybody that uses it without touching the 3D part, with only using, yeah? Not uh, surprising, right on. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what, uh, you know, working in the industry, I tell people, uh, as a compositor, I tell people, yeah, I use Blender, and they, they don't understand it first. They still don't understand that Blender has a compositor, that it can do rotoscoping, that it can do tracking and plane tracking and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, I've got a, I've got a few, uh, I've got a few examples that, uh, that we can go through. Um, other things that, uh, that I've had to do, like in my career over the years, uh, some of the weirder things has been to uh, like take weight off people um, there's, a, there's a very popular actor who everyone in this room knows. Uh, I think he's won multiple Academy Awards. And uh, I worked on a movie of his where there was a very specific shot and he specifically requested that 20 pounds be taken off. So I spent a, a good three days doing that. Um, there's uh, things like, uh, there's, like back to nudity. I've done a lot of nudity. Uh, in, in Austin Powers' gold member, there's a, there's a like a rap video that Dr. Evil does with uh, Mini-Me. And uh, there's a part where there's a girl dancing and uh, you know, she like 
she just dances like across the screen basically from one side to the other and uh, she was wearing a bikini in the shot and they wanted it to look like they wanted me to pixel her out but they didn't want to see any of the bikini they wanted it to look like she was naked under there so in my head first I had to remove the bikini and then pixel her out later so I spent a lot of time making her look naked yeah, which is very interesting I actually used her belly button and kind of moved it um, and uh, the boss, it was, it was fun, the boss came in, he didn't think I was going to go that far, came in, saw it, and was a little uh, shocked. Um, I've had to, uh, that was creating nudity, I've had to take out nudity. There was a shot in uh, the same movie with the actor who wanted the, the weight removed, where some girls are lifting up their shirts, and they wanted to keep a PG rating. So I had to make sure their shirts didn't go all the way up. So that was interesting. So you get all these interesting things. Uh, you know, things like that. And there's, uh, and then again, like I said, the lazy people leaving coffee cups, crew members, everything you can think of has been left in a set. People walking through in the background, cables, wires, all this kind of thing. All that stuff has to be, uh, people are just lazy on set anymore. So, um, so yeah, I thought we could, I'd show you just a couple, I'd start with some, uh, some pretty, uh, oh, really? It just fell asleep. Um, <laughs> Some pretty, oh, I can use this one now, right? Is this one kind of the same? It sounds louder to me. Um, just some really basic things. I'll start with basic things and then I'll show you some, some uh, I mean, all this stuff is pretty basic. There's nothing crazy here, but uh, just like some examples, some uh, techniques where uh, if you do this kind of stuff, Blender's certainly an option. Uh, you know, it can handle a lot more than I think most people think it can. Like, um, this is, uh, this is, literally the, the most basic thing uh, you could do right here is, if it'll play, is this, um, is that playing all right? Yeah, looks good. There's a ceiling up there, and uh, obviously they didn't finish the set, and she, her head crosses it, uh, and this was cropped uh, to, for more widescreen, um, so I didn't have to patch the whole thing, but I did have to patch a little bit of it, and uh, it doesn't get any easier than this. It's basically just a roto with a solid color patched in there and then fix, put her hair back over top. So very, very easy project, but um, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that you know, Blender can crank through those things in 10 minutes. Um, another one is this kind of thing. Uh, there's no door handle there. They had it on there for earlier scenes. They removed it for these <laughs> and uh, to, you know, instead of making, they put tape over it. Why just paint it brown instead of just painting it brown like the rest of the door, they had that paint. This is on a sound stage, so uh, they end up, it'll be easy for him to see and fix if we just paint it green instead of brown. So, end up having to, uh, you know, and again, it's, it's really, it is really easy, but it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's, uh, I, hate to, I hate to call it lazy, but um, it's, uh, it's, it seems like 10 more minutes on set would have saved, you know, an hour or so at home, so. Um, but again, easy thing, track something, a couple rotoscopes, it's done. Um, and I brought these projects, but they're not, they're nothing hard, so I, I don't know if they're worth opening, but, uh, um, then I had some other things. I just finished a project. I don't even know if it's been released yet, so, uh, I'm, I'll show this stuff anyway, because it's going to be released very soon. Maybe this, maybe, uh, nobody from them will see this, but, uh, <laughs> we'll just take a look at some of it. Um. Like the first thing would be, uh, this is a shot. Um, maybe, should I not say what this is for? Uh, uh, it's for the Nerdist. There's a website called the Nerdist um, and they hired me to do some visual effects for a parody video they're doing um, that sh I thought was gonna be released last week. I don't think it's been released yet, so any day now this should be out. But uh, they had this, this just quick shot girl with a, uh, this is supposed to be a bomb and uh, it's just a ball with some styrofoam plugs in it. And they, so I had to put the light on, make a little flashing. Um, and something I did in that, in that project, if I can open that real quick, that I think uh, is interesting. Um, I used a, it looks a little more complex than it really is. Uh, if I do this, backdrop, and um, come on work. I did this technique where uh, you stabilize the frame do all your work and then reintroduce the motion. Um, and it's something, uh, it doesn't work for every shot. It works for 
a certain kind of shot, like this one that just has either her hand is just moving a little bit or the camera's just moving a little bit. You can't have much perspective changing uh, when that's happening. But um, you can see, if we take a look at this, that uh, if I go to, uh, yeah, all of, if this is the, uh, this is the footage and the node directly after it, which ah, I should have move all this junk out of the way. Um, the node directly after it is just the stabilized node. I just stabilized off one point. Um, I think it was the red dot. And uh, it just stabilizes it in the frame. And then I can just layer on the little, uh, the little red dot. I can do some uh, really blurred masks to do the glow and flicker those. Um, yeah, there's the LED light right there, which is tiny. Uh, I don't even know where it is. Um, what's this thing? Yeah. Oh, it's a little slow. Laptop's a little slow. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, that was the idea with this one, was the, the technique of stabilizing something, layering in uh, your elements that you want to do. And then at the very end, um, these are all the glows that I put on. And then at the very end, I reintroduce that, that same track, but I invert it by, um, if you go back here, you take the... Uh, the offsets and just reverse them by multiplying by negative one. And uh, it inverts that data and you can reapply it as a transform. Um, I would suggest always using a transform node if you do want to do this, because uh, uh, you need to pick uh, bilinear so you get a sub-pixel motion. Uh, if you do nearest, you'll get uh, full pixel motion and that's not good. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's one technique is the stabilize and then unstabilize thing. And that also works, um, I have a project I can bring up later. Uh, it works for rotoscoping as well. If you're doing a, a more complex rotoscope, you can stabilize, do your roto, uh, and then you can have less keyframes uh, and then reintroduce the motion at the end again. Um, I have this other shot that is uh, the Riddler, obviously, and he's in a courtroom and they, uh, this was a rented set. It's a, like a freestanding set in Los Angeles, and they needed to have graffiti all over it. Um, this is just, this is a, uh, I don't think this is the finished one. I think this was just a in progress. Um, but this is the kind of thing that a lot of people would see and and say, you know, oh, we're going to need a 3D track, blah blah blah. But you don't. You don't need to. Uh, I, I only 3D track when you absolutely have to. Um, for this one, I just used a lot of plane tracks. Uh, essentially, all, this, all these question marks are just going on two planes, the back wall and the front of this podium. Um, and that's exactly what the, uh, well, I shouldn't have closed that, that was silly. The uh, plane track, do I have that, Riddler, comp. Um, go in here, yeah, so this is the footage. And if you go into the motion tracking, you can see it's just a whole bunch of plane tracks. Um, which, you know, like I said earlier, that's still one of these things that uh, most people who've heard of Blender still don't know it can do plane tracks. Uh, you know, I've got images going off the frame and everything, and it works fine. Uh, I tracked a million things, but you only need four tracks to do a plane track. So I could have done this, you know, if I was in a rush, I could have done this really quickly. Uh, the more tracks you have, of course, the more uh, accurate it'll be. But uh, but you can throw in as many plane tracks as you like, and I can you know then go back and adjust these once I put the image in. If it looks warped, adjust them. Super easy, uh, and it looks like a 3D track, but there was no 3D tracking involved. So uh, very easy. Uh, cancel that. Not closing this time. Um, I did this. There's a uh, there's a lot like I was talking about the 20 pounds. Um, there's a lot of beauty fixes that also happen as well. Uh, a lot of uh, actresses, uh, I think they even work it into their contracts sometime now where they have to approve how they look in their films and all that kind of stuff. So um, you can see this on the left, she's got a, a stronger wrinkle under her eye. She's got, um, she's got a little bit more of a wrinkle here. She's got some, I mean, and this is all normal stuff. This is, it's not like this is stuff to be ashamed of, but... People are, you know, the actresses and all that can get a little crazy with how they look and want to look perfectly smooth and plastic-like and all that. So, um, so yeah, on this side, I've, we've softened a little bit of the, uh, some of the wrinkles and all that and 
kind of taken down this, uh, the, the dark spot there. And again, it's just nothing, nothing difficult, but something that every compositor, if you work in a studio, especially a smaller studio, uh, you're going to have to do this kind of stuff uh, just all the time, it seems like. And then every once in a while, they'll throw you like a tiger from Life of Pi. Uh, um, but yeah, this kind of stuff is all, again, it was just all, uh, just, I did two tracks, and then I would just parent, I'd make little rotos, parent them to whichever track was closest to what, uh, what I was fixing. Um, in the case of the wrinkles, I would just softly blur it. Uh, I would blur the mask as well, because you don't want any hard edges on a mask. Uh, you would also reintroduce the film grain. Uh, every, every camera has its own kind of film grain, even all the digital stuff, because they want it to... Uh, a lot of times it's just to emulate film, so they'll have, uh, you know, certain film cam or digital cameras will have an inherent grain. But, uh, yeah, so you reintroduce that kind of stuff. Uh, for, the, for blending out the, the, uh, that darker spot, all I did was track in a, uh, a solid color. I just made another roto, put in a solid color, and, uh, and that was it for that. Uh, let's see, work, this will work. Uh, yeah, so if I turn off these ones, no, 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 this way. If I turn off those, you can see all that stuff come back. If I turn them back on, they all go away. So it's, it's small stuff like that, but it's, it's uh, important to them, so uh, that kind of stuff. What else do I have? I have, um, oh, I brought some, uh, I br oh, I have that thing. I can show that thing. I've, I've made some node groups to help me out with things. Um, they're nothing complex. They're nothing, uh, it's not like I'm writing tools from scratch or anything. I'm just creating some really simple node groups that just help me with things I do all the time. Um, and there's a, there's a technique for color correcting. Um, uh, I don't know who invented it, but I learned it from a, from a guy named Mark Christensen, who's a ex-Industrial Light and Magic guy, and he's written a bunch of books for After Effects called Studio Techniques. And he gives a technique in there where you look at each channel, each color channel, if you're putting two images together, you look at each one individually, and you match the brights and the darks, and if you go through each channel and do that, when you go back to the full color channels, uh, they're usually in the ballpark. So you've kind of matched them. Uh, and when I was first learning that, I thought, that's ridiculous. How you, that doesn't make any sense. But then you do it, and you look at it, and it makes perfect sense, and it, it works so well. Um, so I kind of made, uh, I actually had Sergey's help on this. This was like two years ago, two and a half years ago. I think I put this together, uh, and I needed some help with controlling, I was trying to use the curves node, I was, and I couldn't link some of the aspects of the curves node to a group node input, and uh, Sergey knows how to do it all with math nodes, so he set that up for me. Um, but let me show you what that does. Uh, this, uh, I did this green screen uh, for this, uh, but please disregard, this is like a two minute green screen, I just wanted to get the green gone for the sake of the color correction thing. Um, but this is another girl from the, uh, the Nerdist video. Um, if I turn all these off, make sure these are all off, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see like the background here is very green, very blue, and she's still, the, the colors that they shot on the, uh, she, has, she has a green screen, let me, let me show you the plate actually. Uh, there it is, plate right there. So she's got blue and green screen. Um, rotate her out. Uh, I do a little, uh, you can see, let me zoom in on her edges a little bit. I did, I tried to do a quick little five minute little edge fix, a little, but it didn't, it only helped slightly. It wasn't that great, but, uh, so yeah, I didn't spend too much time on the, on the key here, but let me show you the color correction stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, so I called it, I called my node Christensen CD, CC, Christensen Keller Correct, just because I link this technique to him uh, in my head, so I always know what it is. Um, but basically, uh, let me go here, let me go a little faster. If I turn this one on, this is how, uh, this is how it just comes in by default. Reds, reds and blacks, or uh, blacks and whites for the red, blacks and whites for the green, blacks and whites for the blue. Blacks are at zero, reds are at one. 
nothing's different, but if I look at the red channel and then I start, you can see how different it is, right? And you can start to dial it in. Um, like she, she just looks completely too bright to be in this scene. Um, I don't know if I can, the blacks are maybe in the ballpark, I guess, but uh, she's just way too bright. So I would take down the, the brights a little bit just by lowering that red, because we're looking at the red channel, I would lower that a little bit. Um, and I kind of already set this up just to make, I didn't know how much time I would have if I'd have even time to work through this, but I'm going to try. Um, but I set it up so I'd have the numbers already uh, ready to go. But uh, so then if we switch, uh, this is more in the ballpark. Like if you look at the, the brights up here, they kind of now match, uh, you know, the grays and all that. They kind of in the ballpark more of her skin. So we can go to the green channel, take a look. Um, the whites are looking pretty good. The whites could, this is a little blown out compared to her, so we would maybe turn that up a little bit, like 1.3. Um, she should get a lot brighter. And the blacks, probably close. We can maybe uh, lift them a little tiny bit, I guess. Like, what do I have down there? 04. Something like that. So, really tiny amounts. Uh, yeah, it's very subtle, but, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff counts. And then uh, go to the blue channel, see how that looks. Blacks are way off, whites are way off. This is really blown out, so 1.4. And then the, uh, the blacks, the, because she's in the foreground, you'd always want to keep the blacks a little bit stronger with things in the foreground than in the background, but uh, you can still probably come up a little bit. So if I was to go 0 0.03. Um, and then when we go back to the full color comp, she fits in that world much better now. Uh, so if I was to turn that off, you can see what she looked like before. She looks way too red now, but uh, this definitely gets her more in the ballpark. And then you can still do, you know, contrast things over top of this with another color correction. Um, but that's a great technique, and I, wanted, I use that technique a lot in other programs, and I really wanted to have it set up in Blender, so I, I did that. Um, well, Sergey did the hard part. I made the group. Um, and then an, uh, I, I had talked to a few people on a mailing list about it, and another guy suggested to just throw in, uh, link these two uh, Keller swatches. So I made yet another version of it where uh, it's literally just two Keller swatches. And you can, uh, can kind of in, let me see if I can figure out, I can move things around. There we go. Plug that in there. Um, these Keller swatches, I can literally just drag it around and you know make her whatever color, whatever kind of color you want. Um, so it's it's the same exact thing, just a slightly easier interface. And I would I I use this the numerical one when I have to be much more accurate, but when I just have to get it in the ballpark quickly, that's when I'll go to this one with the swatches. Um, but that's been a very useful tool for me. Uh, I've spent I've been using Blender now as my main compositor. Well, 50-50 compositor, compositor uh, for maybe three years now, two and a half, three years. So, uh, so I've been trying to make my workflow as easy as I possibly could. Um, what else do I have? I have um, let's see, node group. I have a whole bunch of node groups. I can show you. Uh, I can talk about at least a few of the ones I've built. Um, these are some of them. Um, I've got clamps. I've got different kinds of clamps. Uh, Clamping is really important when you're dealing with black levels in compositing. If you ever, if you ever watched um, a movie that you saw in the theater and then it comes out on TV and it always looks different on TV or things like maybe in the theater the compositing looked great and they were on a green screen in their car but you couldn't tell in the theater and then at home you're like, oh, it looks horrible. It's usually because of black levels because uh, black levels will translate very differently in film space and in TV color space. Um, so black levels are very important and I've got a, uh, a couple tools. These I've got a value clamp. I've got an individual RGB clamp. I've got a, a, a spe very specific black node where I can tint the blacks of anything um, with a, a, a certain threshold and all that, and I can tint them any color. Like if the blacks in the background are more reddish and the ones in the foreground are bluish, I can tint the foreground ones to match the background ones. Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've got a light wrap, which is essential in any compositing. Um, which is bringing the the uh, the background kind of over 
the edges of the foreground. You kind of blur the background and then bring it over. And it's, it's, a, it's very easy to set up manually, but if you're doing that every day, it gets old, so it's easy just to have a node that does it. You just plug a couple things in, you got your mount. Uh, I also cheat a lot. A lot of people, light wrap is originally designed for wrapping bright lights around a foreground object. Uh, but I cheat a lot sometimes and I'll, I'll change it. Uh, to bring that bright stuff over, you would set it to a plus or a screen multiply mode. In the, uh, uh, you can see here I'm using a, an, an add, which is a plus. Um, I'm using that by default in my node group. Um, but sometimes I'll just switch it to mix and I'll still keep the background blurred and I'll mix the background over the edges just to help blend it in a little bit. Um, and I'll turn it way down if I do something like that, but that helps uh, in compositing a lot as well. Um, I've got a chromatic aberration node that I got it set up. Uh, I got this 2D parent one, which I will show you in a moment. Um, unsharp mask, if you've ever used Photoshop, I'm sure you've sharpened something with the unsharp mask. I've got that. Uh, film grain, things like that. Uh, so nothing, nothing complex, just things I was doing every single day that I needed, uh, I needed to get done quicker. Um, what else can I can show you the, uh, yeah, like a lot of people still don't know Blender can rotoscope. I brought rotoscoping examples. Uh, I've got this one that I can show you super quickly here, which is just a car. I believe it's just a car in an alley, nothing fancy. Uh, the footage, I just walk by it kind of just pans across it. And to rotoscope that quickly, I just did two tracks on it. And uh, again, stabilized the footage, did my roto. Uh, if you look at the roto, I rotoed on the stabilized footage, which was very easy. Uh, and then at the do all my color correction, whatever I want to do. In this case, I think I was just desaturating and contrasting everything except for the car. And then, uh, and then put the motion back into the footage again, uh, just to speed up rotoing. And what I could have also done is use those same exact tracks that I have in here, just two of them, I could have all, well, I couldn't have done it with two. I would have needed four, but I could have made a plane track, parent that roto to the plane track, and accomplish the same thing just as quickly, um, you know, with minimal keyframes. Um, this 2D parent example is interesting. I think I can, uh, do I have enough time? Yeah, I guess so, quickly. New, no, I can run through this super quick. Um, a lot of times, uh, in fact, every day in compositing, uh, you're matching, you take something and you're putting it into a plate that already exists. Um, if you're doing things like wire removals, rig removals, patching stuff, you know, somebody left uh, something sitting in the set or you want to take out a boom mic or anything, if you're removing anything, say you wanted to remove birds, you had lots of birds in your scene that you put in two years ago when I did that talk, uh, you can now remove them with just, uh, you know, tracking the birds, putting little patches over them, whatever. Uh, but you're always putting something into a moving plate. And, uh, and to do that, you've got to track, and then you've got to get that tracked data onto your, the image. If you're using a still image, you want to track that in. Uh, and I, I, earlier I showed you, you, you can reverse the, the tracking data by multiplying it by negative one. And it gets a little tiring putting in all these negative one multiply nodes and stuff. Uh, so I kind of built a, um, a node that, that does that a little quicker. Uh, and I can show you how it works. It's, it's really simple. If I can find my footage, I've got this footage right here. Um, let me turn uh, we go. Set scene frames, prefetch. Should load quick, all right? It's all working. Go there. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna track two points so we can do this really quick. Hopefully, uh, close that. Track. At tracked. Lock it over here somewhere, find another one. Like, that looks great, please track. Awesome. Um, so I've got these two tracks, look great. Um, so now if I wanted to put something you know, in the sky or whatever or into the plate in any way, uh, I would have to go down here to the stabilizing settings to be able to access these in the compositor. You have to, uh, let's do this, use nodes, get rid of this. In the movie clip, um, I didn't set this one's super easy, so I didn't bother setting it up beforehand because uh, it's pretty quick. Viewer node, uh, 
change the frame and you can see it. There we go. Um, to access these, the movie clip node comes in with all these, uh, the offset, scale, angle, and all that. Um, but as far as I know, to the only way to access those is to, to use this 2D stabilization panel here. So if I select this left one and I turn on 2D stabilization, I add that left one in, uh, I can then go down to rotation, select the right one, add that one in. So now it's going to take this data and move it into that compositing node, uh, the movie clip one. Um, and uh, me and me and Sergey still have to talk about the scale, where the uh, stabilized scale button is, but we're going to get to that. Um, so yeah, so now now there's data coming out of these, uh, and normally, I'd, like I said, I'd have to do that multiply by negative one, uh, bring in a transform node, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but here, I'm just going to I'm going to grab my image from here to the parent example. I've got a nice moon picture. Uh, this moon has nice rings. And if I bring in, um, oh yeah, okay. If I bring shift F1, if I go here, go to my node groups, I'm gonna grab my little 2D parent helper node, um, which is just all that stuff already built. Uh, oh, come on. One minute, one minute. There we go. Don't want it there, I want it uh, there. So the only reason I'm putting the background node uh, into this, inside of this node, is because it's, it kind of, I'm using the background node to sort of set up a canvas. Blender's compositor does not have a canvas, so if you bring in an image uh, where the image goes right to the boundaries of the image and you want to blur it, it won't blur it outside of the boundaries of that image. Um, you, have to, you have to somehow tell it it's a bigger image, so I cheat that by putting it over the background node, and it lets me, it lets me kind of, uh, it kind of makes the boundaries of my image the project size, the 1920 by 1080. Um, it's just a cheat. It doesn't work in every uh, instance, but uh, but now I've, uh, if I plug these in, offset X, offset Y, if I plug them into the correct things and the angle, uh, now uh, all that tracking data has been moved to that uh, that image. So if I put this over top of it. That, put that over top, add, or screen, I guess would be better. So now everywhere I go in the, in the timeline, that planet is just gonna move right along with the footage. It's gonna take all that tracking data and just apply it to that still frame. So it's essentially tracked in, rotation, all that stuff. Um, and I, I do that a lot, so I, this helped out a very lot. I could just track two points, drop this node in, hook up three wires, and it was done. Um, and I've got other things in here where I can shift it if I want. I can do whatever, 500, uh, probably a little too high, um, maybe like 250, something like that. And I can scale it up a bit if I want. And it still keeps all that, uh, all that tracking data perfectly aligned in there. So, um, so that's some of the stuff that, uh, that's some of the things I've been using Blender for as a compositor, uh, you know, look, using it in place of, other 2D only programs, and it's uh, and that's the kind of stuff I just wanted to show. So I thought it'd be I thought it'd be something different rather than everybody knows Blender can do really good at putting a 3D thing into a a live action plate. So so yeah. No time for questions. No time for questions, but if you yeah. want to talk to Sean, yeah, I'll be. I'm here all weekend. Thank you very much. No problem. Am I just unplugging this? Sorry. Just unplugging, right? Yeah. Okay.